So here's the thing. I don't understand Jason Robertson. And what I mean by that is I can't quite figure out what makes him effective. The 21-year-old has been banging on the Calder Trophy door making a ton of noise, and he has the underlying numbers to back it up. At 5-on-5, five five, he's controlled over 55% of both the shot attempts and the expected goals, as well as contributing 27 primary points. These are very impressive numbers for a 21-year-old, and have rightfully launched him into the Calder Trophy discussion. And he's one of Dallas's best at creating shots not only for himself, but also for his teammates, when we look at his isolated heat maps from Mika Blake McCurdy, as well as microstats tracked by Corey Snader. Notice the large red hot spot in front of the net, which is indicative of him creating a lot of slot chances. All of his underlying numbers point towards Robertson being a very influential play driver for the Dallas Stars. But when I watch his game, I can't help but feel like I'm not watching anything special. It's bizarre. This is one of the few times where I've analyzed a player where the numbers and the eye test don't really line up for me. He doesn't do anything particularly special, nor do I think he has any real subtleties to his game that push him ahead of the pack. At least at first glance. And I think this is going to be an interesting case study for myself going forward. So let's at least start with what he clearly does very well, and that's scoring goals. Robertson is a very accurate finisher, and I think this skill is heightened by his ability to get shots off from uncomfortable positions. Robertson is very comfortable in the slot, with good hands to pick pucks out of the scrum and confidence to elevate his shot with only a couple feet separating himself and the goaltender. He's also a very balanced shooter, and I think this next clip is a great example of what I mean. He receives a pass on the rush, and as he prepares to shoot, watch what he does with his right foot. He has the balance, flexibility, and coordination to get low into his stance to start his weight transfer. And as he leans into his shot and leans into his right foot to stabilize him, notice that he digs into the ice with his outside edge. From experience, I can tell you it is very difficult to balance on your outside edge, especially in a fluid motion like Robertson does here. To be able to find his balance while under pressure, and at full speed, and to still transfer his weight into a shot with pinpoint accuracy, it's NHL talent. He also understands how to use his opponents as screens on the rush. I particularly like this play here as he crosses the blue line and cuts a bit to his left, looks off to his left as well, doesn't show that he's going to shoot. He knows that he has bodies cutting to the front, and quickly gets a shot off before the goaltender knows what happened. I think when we talk about and evaluate an effective goal scorer, there's two main contributing factors. There's first the individual skills like the shot power, shot accuracy, and if they have the ability to deceive with uh, changing the release angle, etc. But then there's also the macro component of positioning. Can the player put themselves in the right spots on the ice at the right time? And this is where you start to hear the cliches come in like, oh, player X has a nose for the net, or player Y is willing to take the puck to the dirty areas of the ice. And a majority of Robertson's goals have come from the dangerous areas of the ice, and he's displayed great timing, not getting to his spots too late or too early, whether he's curling from up top or playing behind checks from down below. When the Stars have sustained offensive zone pressure, I think Robertson loves being the high forward who is able to curl at the blue line and then cut into the middle, hoping to receive a pass. But this positioning of Robertson's is also an area that I'm not fully confident in, which is where some of these contradictory thoughts come into play. There were a ton of goals from Robertson where I just thought to myself, this is just brutal defensive coverage. There is no way Robertson should have been given this much time and space alone in the slot. Hey, post-production Brett here. So I'm editing the video and normally when I watch these shifts, I don't have sound on, so that means the commentary is muted. Um, but as I was editing, I thought, hey, I'm just gonna check out what the broadcasters were saying about this goal. And even the Detroit commentators couldn't believe the bad defensive breakdown that the Red Wings suffered. They center, work it around, and they score. Oh God. The guys are talking to himself like, how could we let this happen? I wouldn't quite classify it as maybe a lack of respect for Robertson from the defending teams. It's just, I think we see this a lot actually in rookie seasons. Defenses don't show the same type of urgency to rookies as they do to say an Austin Matthews or an Alex Ovechkin. But as the rookie starts to make more of a name for himself, teams then start to pay attention and check him a lot harder, which is where I think some of the sophomore slump comes into play for some players. However, if you are a Jason Robertson fan, I think there is some good news there when it comes to players defending Robertson harder in the future. Robertson has a skill that is in no way sexy, and I think it was something that I actually undervalued coming into making this video. 
He's very strong on his stick, and I think this allows him to win a lot of contested 50-50 pucks. There were a ton of times when I was watching Robertson where he was met with a defender stick and I thought to myself, oh, there's no way this is going to work out well for Robertson. And yet, while the defender stick did prove to be a hindrance, it didn't fully deter Robertson from making a play. The defender stick was only a minor inconvenience for Robertson, as one way or the other he found a way to stick onto the puck and finish his thought. And when I realized this, it was actually kind of an eye-opener into what I now appreciate about Robertson's game. At first glance, I actually think I wrote him off a bit just because I wasn't blown away by his ability to problem solve. He wasn't using speed as a weapon, nor was he misdirecting opponents. Instead, he would kind of just slow the game down and let the play come to him. He would draw defenders in towards him, and then he would make his play. And I think this trait really shows up in his playmaking skills. Like this play here on the power play, I couldn't believe that he still hung on to the puck after. This Florida Panther is all over Robertson, and yet somehow he is still able to come away with the puck and make a play. So philosophically, I don't agree with going into these 50-50 types of plays, because it's exactly that, a 50-50 chance of you coming away with the puck or your opponent coming away with the puck. When players use different weapons, like their speed, weight shifts, edge work, or any other kind of misdirection in order to tilt the scales into their favor, it becomes less and less of a 50-50 battle and maybe more of a 60-40 or a 70-30. But maybe I'm being too hard on Robertson. Maybe he's one of those players where 50-50 battles aren't actually 50-50. And I think this is where someone like me in the public domain that doesn't have access to copious amounts of data is at a disadvantage. If I could somehow see a stat that showed me the number of puck battles Robertson has won compared to lost, and it showed a greater than 50% chance of him winning these battles, then maybe I would be more okay at first glance of him going into these types of head-to-head -head matchups. You know what's not 50-50? The number of viewers that watch my videos who aren't currently subscribed to the channel. The last time I checked, over 75% of you are not currently subscribed, so if you like the analysis and the content that I'm making, please consider subscribing as it'll really help me towards my goal of creating the best hockey content on the internet. Okay, back to the video. So to wrap things up, I think Jason Robertson is going to be a very interesting case study for me as a talent evaluator. I think the way he plays hockey in some ways are so philosophically different from how I view the game of hockey that at first glance I wasn't quite able to appreciate the skill and beauty of his game. I think his ability to read the ice is very very good and that shows up a lot in his chemistry with Rupi Hints. Rupi Hints. Rupi Hints. <laughs> As I was watching Robertson, I found myself each time going, wow, Hints is a player. So maybe that's a guy I'll come back on at a later date. So getting back to it, I, I think this is a very interesting example of when the numbers and the eye test don't necessarily fully align. The numbers point towards Robertson being a legitimate play driver for the Dallas Stars, and yet my eye test didn't really agree with that. And me as a hockey analyst, I'm a huge supporter of using the two together to come to a conclusion. If the numbers are bad and the eye test is bad, then chances are that player doesn't have much of a future. And if the opposite is true, then you've probably got a star on your hands. But where the real secret sauce comes in is when the two don't align. And having the ability to dig deeper and find the discrepancies between the two. And then from this due diligence, you then have the added confidence and conviction to say, yeah, I can live with these discrepancies, or no, these are too much of a red flag that I just can't ignore it. Now, when it comes to Robertson, I think I'm still on the fence, which I know, it's a cop-out answer. But I'd really like to wait and see how he performs in his sophomore year when he has more of a target on his back and see how he performs. And thankfully, if you're the Dallas Stars, you have one more year left on his entry-level contract before you really have to decide if you want to bridge him or sign her to a longer-term deal, and you'll have a better idea of what he is as a player. Now, if you're wondering what I think his odds are of winning the Calder Trophy, you're going to have to wait till next week when I also talk about Kirill Kaprizov. But until then, let me know your thoughts.